It's great to be here. I'm not quite sure why I'm here. Uh, I'm not an artist. Uh, I don't do these kinds of things. Uh, what I do do is uh, try to teach computers about the world. And I guess in a way, that's what uh, this symposium is about, is trying to understand the world better, trying to escape from these various tyrannies so that we can have a more complete picture. And uh, trying to teach a computer about the world is one way to really understand it. Because if you try and the computer doesn't get it, it means you didn't quite understand things maybe as well as you thought you did. So this is how I see kind of the creative or artistic process. So you, you uh, start with an artist, uh, but of course it doesn't end there. Uh, I see that there's more parts to it. You got to have something about the world that the artist wants to convey. You've got to have a medium to do it. And you've got to have an audience to ob observe it. And it's the interplay of these four that's, uh, that makes it all come together. You can't concentrate on just one. Now, if we want to understand that interplay, one thing we can do is uh, fool around with the various pieces. And one thing to think about maybe is, what if you replace some of these pieces with computers? Where, what do you end up with? So here's one example. Uh, Scott Draves is a uh, digital artist who's created this environment for, uh, for making pictures and making movies. And uh, there's a little description of computer code, and it makes one of these abstract images, like the one you see there, or uh, one like this. And then there's also uh, animated versions of them. And they're defined in this uh, kind of language for describing them. He doesn't have to draw them himself. It just sort of gives parameters of how curvy they are and so on. But the whole enterprise is controlled not just by uh, Scott, but by the audience as well. So I put the audience here in front of computers, which is important because they're viewing the work on a computer screen rather than in a gallery, but also because they're connected to the internet and they're feeding back. So they say, I like this picture, do more like that, or I don't like this picture, do something else, and then the pictures evolve over time. So it, it's uh, gone beyond just the artist creating something to this, uh, uh, the audit artist plus the audience working together. Now that's always happened in the history of art, that there's this feedback loop between the artist and the, and the audience and it changes uh, uh, what's being made. But here the feedback is instantaneous rather than over uh, years and longer periods of time. Okay, here's another uh, example. Uh, my colleagues, Fernando Vegas and Martin Wattenberg, done a number of uh, visualizations of computer data. There's one here. I, I chose to do the, uh, the still version rather than the uh, movie one. But uh, you can look it up. There's these uh, beautifully flowing diagrams of the wind throughout the United States, visualized in this unique way, much more interesting than what you see in the nightly news. Uh, so they do things like that. And here's another example. You can't quite tell what this is. Uh, but you can read that there's months there, and what they've done is they've taken all the pictures they could find of the Boston Common, analyzed the colors in each of those pictures, and plotted them by month. So you can see the uh, greenest part is at the top in the summertime, and the orangest part is uh, in the lower right in the fall, and the whitest part is in the bottom in the winter. So it's a way of visualizing change over time out of something that they just, it's, it's like found art. They, would, they didn't take these pictures, they went out and found all the pictures on the internet. Uh, in the process of doing this, one of the things they realized is that the internet is, is this huge uh, uh, museum or a gallery where you can see images, you can see a wide variety of images, and you can see the same in images over and over again. One thing they were interested in is how constant is that? Uh, and there are problems like uh, color gamut that we heard of, and they wondered how true that was. Uh, and the answer was not very. And so they have made this series of collages. Here's one of a, of a Klimt painting that you probably know, where the collage is taken from different representations of the same image. And you can see what, what a wide variety there is in skin tones and so on, uh, uh, just of the different reproductions in the various museums around the web. Okay, here's another example of uh, uh, before I was at Google, I was at uh, NASA, and I got a chance to work with uh, Ilan Norbosch. And 
he's done a version of this uh, photosynth-like uh, project in a very different way. So rather than relying on sophisticated software, he built a piece of hardware. He's a roboticist, so he said, I'm going to build a robot to do this so that I don't have to wait for my family going ahead. I just mount the, uh, the camera on this robot and uh, it does its thing and it holds it perfectly still, rotates around the nodal point of the lens. Uh, and then you get images like this. So this is a uh, seven gigapixel panorama. I tried to find one that would show us, uh, but, uh, but I, I didn't quite get it. We're kind of behind a hill, so uh, we're not quite in this, this image, but it is San Francisco. Uh, and to give you an, an example of what seven gigapixels mean, uh, right here, uh, you can't quite see it, but there's a, a little park, and if you uh, zoom in there, you can see, uh, well, you can't quite read the, the writing on the basketball, uh, but you can tell that the shot's going in. Uh, so that's the level of detail you get. So seven gigapixels, you know, you might have a camera with seven megapixels, so that's three of Alvi's orders of magnitude, and it does make a qualitative difference in what you can get. Yeah, so the, the, uh, the camera moves. This was taken with a 600 millimeter lens, so a very narrow field of view, and it takes one shot, moves over a little, takes the next, the next, the next, and, and just sort of pans all the way across. So and the robot drinking a giant puddle with the thin straw. Yeah, yeah. And so you will see some of these uh, mutant effects of uh, cars and people that are, are walking, and if they're at the boundary of one of those pictures, it doesn't come out quite right. Um, now let's move on. Here's another ex example of, of an artist, uh, David Byrne, and if you, uh, you, some of you may well remember his uh, second album that has this very uh, Huckney-esque uh, Polaroid montage. Uh, but in uh, this book uh, that recently came out, uh, how Music Works, uh, Byrne really describes how these four pieces come together in, in a beautiful way. And he talks about uh, the music that, uh, his style of music that developed in the 80s in uh, CBGBs and, and other clubs in New York. And he said, uh, well, you know, that was different than, than what you hear at Carnegie Hall. And for a lot of reasons. Uh, it's not just one reason. Uh, so the instruments are different in part because that's what people are used to traditionally playing, but in part because of the acoustics of the hall are suited for those instruments. The groups that played at CBGB's are there uh, because they were invited to play, but also because the rents in the neighborhood were low enough that they could live there and interact with each other and form and reform bands of different kinds and, and evolve over time. Uh, and so it, there is this interaction uh, between all four pieces. Now, uh, one of the things he said that I thought was very interesting is uh, when they expanded the Talking Heads from uh, a four-piece band and added some backup singers and some dancers, he had to come up with, with a dance, and he hired a dance director, and, uh, and she came up with this approach to deciding what the right dance was for a song. Is she told all the dancers, listen to the music and count out at an eight-beat count and make some movement and just start repeating it. And then as you're doing that, look around you and see what all the other dancers are doing. And if you like something that somebody else is doing, incorporate it, that into your movement and keep going. And then when we get to the point where everybody's doing the same movement, then we know we're done. So I thought this was interesting uh, uh, from an artistic point of view and also from a computational point of view because what this artistic uh, director described and probably wasn't realized it is what we in computer science call a genetic algorithm. And this is a, a well-known technique where we say we take different representations of a solution and we combine them together and we keep going until we get the right answer. Uh, that's been done in a lot of places. I'll go back to, uh, to NASA again and my colleague uh, Jason Lone uh, uh, invented this antenna that flew on the uh, SCS-5 mission in 2006. This is the X-band antenna. You see it's a tiny little thing about the size of a quarter. And you can see the really weird shape of the, uh, the metal pieces coming out of it. So no sane engineer could have ever designed this antenna looking like that. And yet it's exactly what they needed for the low power characteristics of, of communicating in the way that it did. And this was done with a genetic algorithm. So the genetic algorithm says, 
we're going to have a description of this antenna in terms of the lengths and the bends and the angles and so on. And then we'll have different descriptions of possible designs. And then we'll get the, you have those two designs mate with each other. You take half of this design and half of that design, you put them together, and then you measure whether that's better, and you keep the dance going until you get the, the right answer. And that's how uh, this antenna was designed and flew. Now, uh, one example where uh, what I do in machine learning does uh, maybe over uh, intersect a little bit with art is in uh, understanding images of the world, uh, understanding objects and what they are out there. And there are practical applications of that, like the uh, self-driving car, where we need to have uh, a representation of the world and all the objects in it. So we have to be able to find uh, other cars, pedestrians, bicyclists, and so on. We have to take these pixels and understand what's actually out there. Now, uh, you've probably seen uh, examples of that in, say, face recognition. So you can buy a $50 camera now, and it'll put a little green rectangle or around the faces that it finds. But that's not very interesting, because that was done by an engineer who very carefully said the only thing this camera has to do is recognize faces and nothing else. And so the, the algorithm was written precisely for that task. What if you wanted to teach a computer to say, well, let's recognize everything there is in the world, including new things that we've never thought of before? How would you go about doing that? Now, for this audience, I, I uh, constrained myself. I, I removed the tyranny of the equation and said, uh, we're going to explain this all without any math. Uh, so let's see how it goes. And I'm going to do it by way of analogy. So suppose you were a, uh, a mosaic uh, maker, and you had this task of coming up with beautiful pictures, and you do this kind of mosaics, and people buy them and, and put them in their bathrooms and kitchens. And now you, one day you got the clever idea of saying, well, this is really uh, tough work creating these, and, and you know, I can only create the, the pictures that I think are interesting, but our customers might want something else. So say you said, okay, I'm gonna have a service where a customer can send me in a picture and then uh, we'll uh, put that onto tiles and, and send that back out to the customer. So that's a great service. Unfortunately, it turns out it's too expensive to uh, create the little custom tiles uh, anew for every image that comes in. So you get the bright idea of saying, well, let's have an inventory of tiles that we can choose from, and now we don't have to make the new tiles each time. We just have to select them from this box of inventory of tiles. And maybe the tiles don't have to be precisely matched to the image. They just have to be close enough. So here, the picture's a little bit blurry, the color's a little bit off, but it's close enough. Uh, so I only need a set number, you know, uh, maybe a thousand different tiles, and I can pick from those and create the right image. So what does that get us? Well, we have to decide what's going to be in that inventory. How do we do that? Well, by looking at some sample images by saying what's out there in the world, or at least uh, the part of the world that people are interested in taking pictures of, what are the common components of those if we broke that up into pieces? If we can answer that question, then we could build these pictures, and incidentally, now we've got a representation at a smaller level of what's actually out there in the world that people find interesting. Uh, and what can we do with that representation? So people tried to address this problem uh, not by making uh, tile pieces, but by making an inventory of uh, mathematical functions that represent pieces of the images. And if you say, I restrict myself to having a, only a small number of pieces, it's a way of compressing the image, like we do in, in say, the JPEG encoding of, of getting a smaller representation of an image, uh, then what are the interesting pieces? What are images made of? And so people asked this question in around uh, 1996. Uh, uh, Altschizen at Berkeley did that. And the answer was, uh, pictures are made out of lines. So that's not very interesting, right? We kind of knew that already. Any of you artists who ever picked up a pencil or a brush or a, or a charcoal knew that you can make lots of good, good pictures out of lines. Uh, so we want to go beyond that and say, is there anything more interesting in pictures besides just lines? And so the idea that hit around 2006 was to say, instead of just having one inventory of pieces, let's have three levels of inventory, or, or maybe more. And we'll uh, shove the pictures in, and then we'll find the best lines to represent those. And then we'll see, if you combine the lines, what would they combine into? And if you combine that into something else, what would that combine into? And worked on that for a couple years. And suddenly, there was this breakthrough. 
when we now get something like this, where at the first level, pictures are made out of lines, that's boring, but at the second level, interesting stuff has now started to emerge. Pictures are made out of noses and uh, mouths and eyes, and, uh, and then at the next level, they combine to, to form faces, and uh, if you put in pictures of cars, you get wheels and doors, and those combine to, f to find cars. So for the first time, we have representations at interesting levels. The, the computer is automatically picking out uh, aspects of the world that it found interesting, or aspects of the reflection of the world uh, that was given to it by what, uh, uh, what was selected as, as the photos that were given to it. So it's now parsed the world. We didn't tell it that there's such a thing as an eye or a nose or a wheel. It just said, from the pictures you gave me, I've discovered that these things are interesting. Now, why are we able to do that now? Uh, in part, uh, Moore's Law, uh, we were able to throw 100 times more computing power at it than anybody had ever tried before. And, and that allowed us to, uh, to give you more images. Uh, so we went through uh, 10 million YouTube uh, uh, still video frames. We haven't quite done all the videos yet. We're, we're still doing one frame at a time. Soon, the video's coming soon. Uh, and we're able to do it at a, at a level of detail for each image that was, that was also 100 times higher than anybody's done before. And you stick all those images in and you ask what comes out, right? So are the noses and, and eyes gonna come out? What's gonna come out? And then uh, uh, you can ask at the top level, what's in my collection? What's in my inventory of things that are important? And uh, not surprisingly, when YouTube c goes in, uh, cats come out. So here's two of the pieces of the inventory of the best representations of, of what the computer has spontaneously said represents uh, the input, and one of them is a cat, and, and one of them is a human face. Uh, and here's more examples of, uh, then you go ask it, uh, are there any cat pictures? And it says, yes, I found these. Are there any people pictures? Yes, I found this. Uh, and here's some more examples of the types of categories that it's building. So some of them are abstract, uh, these patterns of uh, dots and so on. Some of them are, again, uh, building up at the lowest level. We had lines, and even at the top level, we have diagonal lines going to the right and left. We have circles. Uh, and then we have things like uh, zebras and keyboards and wine bottles and pizza. So, you know, uh, what we've done here then is we said we've, we've got all these pieces coming together, uh, these, these four parts of the artist, the world, the medium, and the audience. And by putting the computer in there, we've learned a little bit about, uh, about how this process works about how we can extract something that's interesting about the world. And maybe we've learned that uh, creativity is, is possibly not as, as uh, unfathomable as we thought it was. Maybe creativity is more about uh, just pulling out the common pieces and reassembling them in, in interesting ways rather than a, an unimaginable uh, leap. Uh, and so, yes, you know, there's uh, some formulas and some math in there, but, but I think that's not really the interesting part. The interesting part is that the way we learn about the world is by taking these representations of it, these pieces that were selected uh, by the photographer or whoever and said, this is what I want you to know about the world. And then all we did is count. Right. So basically, uh, here's my uh, my hero, uh, the gr the world's greatest computer scientist. Everything I needed to know, I learned in Sesame Street. And if we just count up how much of uh, this or that there is in the world, we can understand what's out there. Okay. Thank you.